Hello, I'm Jennifer Potter, an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Women's Health Programs at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Fenway Health in Boston. It's my pleasure to be here today with Dr. Katie baratz dalk who is Chief Resident in the Department of Psychiatry at the Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Dalk, welcome. Thank you. What are the differences between the following terms? Sexual behavior, sexual orientation, gender identity, and differences in sex development? So, you know, as we've talked about, differences in sex development is really a biological term that describes a whole host of conditions that where people's biological sex is a little bit different than what we typically expect in a binary definition of male and female, where testes, penis, XY chromosomes don't quite line up, for example. Um, on the other hand, gender identity, gender expression, sexual behavior, sexual orientation, really, if you think about it, don't really have all that much to do with whether or not those things are lining up. A, a person's gender identity is sort of a reflection of how they feel about what they have, if you will, um, and a gender expression is how they choose to express that. But it doesn't require that the person have the full complement of what we expect to be typical for a male or a female. Um, similarly, sexual behavior and sexual orientation is sort of what you do with what you have and who you want to do it with. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are many people who have a DSD who will have an experience that is cisgender, meaning they are mostly typically female, they experience themselves as female, and they present themselves as female, and there are people who um, may identify as being L, G, and B. Um, there are also some individuals who have a a sex assignment at birth based on the best information that's available and then ultimately decide that that gender doesn't work for them. So they may have an experience that's trans. So one of, um, so for example, I am a, I have complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome. So I have XY chromosomes. I was born with internal testes. I am attracted to men and women. I'm partnered to a man and I have a female gender expression and identity. So it can be really just as rich as it is with other people and their happening on different spectra. And in your experience, what sorts of strategies have worked to help health professionals distinguish between these different um, terms and ha really have an understanding of them? Mm -hmm. So I think the thing that is really helpful is inviting people to think about initially sort of challenging the notion that sex, gender, sexual orientation is a binary concept and inviting people to think about the different combinations, permutations, variations that you might see along each of those spectrums. And one of the things that I find that's really useful is actually lining them up with each other. So there's, um, there's an image that is sort of floating around the internet of the genderbred person, mm -hmm. um, where the person's genitals are sort of indicating sex on a spectrum from male to female. Um, their clothing are representing the person's gender expression on a spectrum of male to female and so on. And putting that graphically, once you've challenged this idea that these things happen on a binder, binary, excuse me, I think is, is a really effective way of doing that. What sorts of barriers do you uh, come up against in working with trainees and trying to get these concepts across? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the sort of first barrier is that people don't um, they just have very little exposure to these notions and the exposure that they have is often in a very sensationalized concept mm -hmm. or context. So for example, we'll be talking about differences in sex development and people will say, oh, do you mean hermaphrodites? Now for people who have a DSD, that is a, um, a pejorative word that can be really hurtful. But if someone has never met someone with a DSD that they know of, if they don't understand that, and the only time they've seen it is on you know, a late night talk show or something, um, it can be hard to put that into context. So I think the first thing is sort of um, people not being exposed to or socialized to these ideas. Um, and then the other big barrier is that, which we were just talking about, which is having difficulty understanding that um, DSD is about your biological sex, 
um, and that it's distinct from gender and sexuality and sexual orientation, and that most people with DSD do not take it as an identity. Um, but once you get past those things, I think it, people can, can grasp the concept. And, you know, we, we'll sort of use, um, at, at the risk certainly of wanting, making sure that you're being sensitive to overly pathologizing these things, um, using sort of analogy of saying this is a chronic condition just like, um, just like anything else might be. It, it, it's, it's a chronic hormonal imbalance just like diabetes might be, for example, or it's a trait just like being tall or blonde is. And that helps people put it into context, I think. And in terms of the languaging, it seems to me that uh, clearly the terminology has changed across mm. the years as things have unfolded uh, and people are becoming more knowledgeable. But you mentioned the term hermaphrodite and then there's intersex and then there is DSD, which some people will say means disorders of mm. sex development. Uh, and now we say differences of sex development. Mm. Can you comment on these different kinds of terminology and why we would choose one over another? Mm -hmm. So hermaphroditism was the predominant medical nomenclature for many years. You would describe um, someone with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome who has the XY karyotype and internal testes as having male pseudo hermaphroditism, which if you think about it is a really confusing concept. Most people have a hard time understanding what hermaphrodite <laughs> is alone and then you say pseudo hermaphrodite, like what does that even mean? So. The, there was a transition that was made to start using intersex mm -hmm. terminology, um, but even that was felt to be confusing. It sort of seemed to emphasize um, the sort of state that the person is in as opposed to the process by which their sex developed, which is really more biologically accurate. Um, and though there are many people who still prefer intersex over DSD because it was a term that was used a lot in the early days of the intersex and DSD advocacy movement, the preferred medical terminology now is differences of sex development because it, it really does emphasize the process by which these things occur. Now that said, there are many people who will say, oh, I, I don't have that, I have this condition, which is just a little bit different than than other people around me have. So I think it's really important to, when you're speaking with patients, to sort of see where they are in their own process, to say whether, whether they're gonna say to you, you know, I have a difference in sex development, or I have hypospadias, or I had this thing that was corrected, and now it's really not an issue for me. So in terms of an approach to a patient, uh, let's say who you know has a difference of sex development and you may be meeting for the first time, mm -hmm. how would you broach that topic with them in a sensitive manner? Mm -hmm. I, I think the best way to do that is to start, as we always do, in a, a gentle and open-ended sort of way, which is to say, what's your understanding of your medical history? or um, what's your understanding about your body or your anatomy? Um, what's your understanding of how this came to be? What do you already know? What questions do you have? Mm -hmm. And in the process of talking to that person, not only are you going to identify some knowledge gaps that, that may be important for, mm -hmm. to fill in, you're also able to pull out the language that that person is most comfortable using that you can clarify and use with them as you're also educating them. And how about uh, with uh, a family, a, mm -hmm. a young child and parents where this is just coming to light? How would you engage the parents in a conversation about what's going on? Mm -hmm. So again, I think starting from, you know, what's your sense of what's going on? Mm -hmm. How do you conceive of this? I think it's very important that we say to families from the get-go, you know, you have a healthy child your child is going to be just fine. You know, when we talk to parents mm -hmm. who have children who are born with these conditions, there's so much hubbub around what their genitals look like that it's rare for someone to just sort of step out and say, you know, hold on, your child still has 10 fingers and mm -hmm. 10 toes mm -hmm. and, and they're gonna be just fine. Um, so emphasizing that from the beginning is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that providers need to do is to begin to work with families to find metaphors that work to understand what the condition is, whether um, you're using to borrow a, a 
colleague of mine who works in Buffalo, he he uses the language of girl juice and boy juice. Mm -hmm. And some people have all boy juice, some people mm -hmm. have all girl juice, some mm -hmm. people have a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, or when we're talking about um, androgen and sensitivity syndrome, where there's a, the androgen receptor isn't functional, we can talk about androgens being a key that unlock the door to male typical development. Mm -hmm. But if you have a lock that doesn't work, mm -hmm. you can't unlock that door. And it really serves two purposes. It serves the purpose of educating the family and you're also giving them tools to then go and educate the people that, mm -hmm. they're, that they're gonna have to. Mm -hmm. Parents get very anxious about how they'll explain this to babysitters mm -hmm. who might be changing the child's diaper, mm -hmm. how they'll explain it to other family members, mm -hmm. how they'll explain it to their child. Mm -hmm. And beginning to model some of these tools is terrifically important and useful. Mm -hmm. When you use the word condition, it makes me wonder if there are any situations in which, from a medical perspective, mm -hmm. in the sense that somebody really requires treatment for a condition, that might actually be an apropos way to, to think about it. Sure, absolutely. So there are, um, there are certain DSDs in which there are accompanying medical concerns that need to be urgently addressed or the child is at risk of serious illness or injury. So the classic example is salt wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia where an XX child um, has atypical genitals but they also have adrenal insufficiency mm -hmm. and if that is untreated the child can can have a, hyper, have a, have a vascular collapse, excuse me. So it's important, I think, for when we're, when we're talking with, with trainees to make this distinction so that they understand that there are some conditions that require um, urgent or emergent medical attention um, to, to stabilize and treat the child. And other conditions in which um, the, this is just a variation that can be addressed in a, in a more decompressed sort of way. Now, the other important thing to realize, though, is that even in congenital classic salt wasting, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which really is the urgent critical issue is the renal insufficiency, excuse me, the adrenal insufficiency. And the, the appearance of the child's genitals is not an emergent concern. So working with trainees and also families to understand, you know, this is what's critical and this is what we have time to work through and understand is an important consideration. We've talked just a little bit about some of the resources that are available to medical educators and uh, one of the things that comes to mind is that there may be an, a really great opportunity here to, for a trainee to work in a team mm -hmm. of professionals where hormonal treatment is part of the care and surgery may be mm -hmm. part of the care at least at some point and probably some psychological social supports are going to be important and I'm wondering if you have suggestions along those lines. Absolutely, and, and the recommendations for standard of care for these um, individuals, really particularly in the pediatric population, is that there is a multidisciplinary team that's working together that includes urology, endocrinology, some sort of behavioral health support, um, pediatric and adolescent gynecology when appropriate. And that is a, a phenomenal experience for a student or trainee to be involved and even just sitting in on those case conferences to hear people talk about the cases and understand how the medical decisions are being made. Now there aren't uh, multidisciplinary teams like that at every medical institution, but the sites where there are medical, where there are teams like that, those teams have their own sets of resources. So um, Sick Kids in Toronto, for example, is one such place. Um, Vancouver Children's, Seattle Children's, um, Oklahoma City Health Sciences University as well, um, and another, a, no, a number of other institutions have resources about how their team functions and how they're delivering care. So this could be a really uh, terrific opportunity for a trainee not only to learn a lot about differences of sex development, mm -hmm. but also to have the experience and learn how to work in an inter, uh, multidisciplinary, interprofessional setting. Absolutely. I have one more question, sure. which you can take or leave. If you could uh, give the audience one take home point that you think is most important about caring for patients with DSD, uh, what would that be? Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's most important to recognize is that although many patients and families have had bad experiences with providers in the past, 
it just takes one good mm -hmm. provider mm -hmm. and one good experience for their sense of trust and sense of faith in medical care to be restored. And it, it does not take a huge knowledge base about the individual's condition. What it really takes is a willingness to learn, a willingness to sit and listen and speak with the individual about their particular experience and to use whatever evidence there is available um, and really apply it to that individual person. We don't have the benefit of large randomized multi-center control trials to help us make clinical decisions. So it's really an opportunity to sit down and be with people and, and build a, a really strong therapeutic relationship that way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalk. I really appreciate um, your meeting today. And that concludes our video uh, on uh, DSD.